Hi, I'm Michael Staten. I'm a partner at Learn Capital. This is a presentation made specifically for the World Innovation Summit for Education based in Doha in uh, November of 2014. This is made for their accelerator program. There are seven uh, projects, initiatives, startups, uh, entrepreneurial teams uh, that are participating and I've reviewed some of your materials and look forward to getting to know you better. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person. I fell ill uh, off of a month of travel this past week and it would uh, just not be very wise of me to get on a flight and uh, kind of reactivate my illness and, and potentially spread it to all of you all. Anyway, um, I have spoken with Jan Matern from uh, Emerge Venture Labs. He and I go back several years now and have a similar frame of mind and I've asked him to be helpful to you all uh, this week and uh, maybe implement some of some of my ideas with you guys on the ground there. Uh, you'll meet him, uh, I believe, on Tuesday. But uh, anyway, I look forward to collaborating with you remotely, and um, I'm going to make time to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with each of you, as well as prepare specific comments for, for your projects. So this presentation is actually an evolution of a presentation over time, and I will continue to iterate on it and eventually... Uh, it will manifest itself in many blog posts and potentially um, a digital book. Uh, I call it the EdTech Startup Handbook. Uh, it's more or less notes that we have as education entrepreneurs um, related to Learn Capital uh, and notes that we have as uh, early stage investors into the education startup ecosystem. Uh, please be in touch with me about it, ask me questions. Um, ask me tough questions, ask me to explain myself better, ask me to give you more context or background or information uh, because this is, again, it's an, an iterative process between us at Learn Capital and uh, the companies that we connect with and uh, that, that seek our insights and uh, would benefit from kind of the collective wisdom of all of the education initiatives and entrepreneurial activity around the world. A little bit on Learn Capital, just so you know uh, who you're hearing from. Uh, so Learn Capital is likely the most active investor into education technology anywhere in the world. Uh, over the past five years, we've invested in nearly 50 education technology startups. So that's at a pace of uh, about 10 a year. Um, and we have invested in essentially every age and demographic, every product type, every media type, um, every device, uh, uh, leading with any device, and um, any type of education or learning service, either directly to consumer or to schools or institutions or corporations. Uh, and so uh, we like to think that we have a, a broad view of the space and we like to think that we have a global approach to the space. Uh, a little bit more on me, I uh, am, my name is Michael Staten. I uh, come to venture capital not as a financier or a venture capitalist at heart. Uh, I really started as an educator and consider myself an educator. Uh, I was just very frustrated at the lack of technology supporting me as a teacher my uh, my students as learners and started teaching myself to code. Eventually I founded a company and took that through several rounds of investment and growth. Uh, then worked as a venture partner for New Schools Venture Fund, which is kind of the most prolific K-12 school support technology investor. Uh, then went on to be kind of a co-conspirator, uh, not really a co-founder, but a conspirator. Uh, with Dev Bootcamp and UnCollege, and now uh, I'm a partner at Learn Capital, where I've led investments into, um, at this point, about eight companies over the past two years, and uh, look forward to continuing to support many other companies um, by either investing in them or advising them and helping them with uh, strategy and accessing you know, important parts of the ecosystem. And I look forward to trying to help you guys in the same way. 
because you all are entrepreneurial teams and we're here to talk about the startup process and might be welcome to actually define what a startup is, uh, I really appreciate Dave McClure, the founder of 500 Startups, take on this, uh, which is that a startup who's marching into unknown unknowns uh, is really just confused about at least one of three things, uh, what their product is, who their customer is, or how they make money. And if the organization is actually certain about what all three of those things are, it's kind of no longer a startup. And thus, uh, because these three things are either confusing or unknown, uh, the startup is actually in a mode where it's constantly learning and the unit of progress is actually validated learning. In terms of what we look for at Learn Capital, we look for five kind of uh, major areas uh, of attributes of, of the teams and the companies that come to us. So the first is market attractors. Uh, this is the most important to us because we are in venture capital. Uh, we're really looking for large and growing markets, particularly fast growing markets and ones with properties where there's very little market friction uh, and there's the ability to rapidly scale. We also look for team dynamics. So we look for whole teams, which I'll discuss in a second. Uh, and we look for um, teams that have a strong bond, have a great origin story and uh, work well together. We also look for quantified validation and traction, which I'll get into later um, as I talk about moving from kind of anecdotal to, uh, to quantified. And then we look at for product velocity and maturity. Uh, with velo by velocity, I mean iteration speed, um, the speed at which a company can uh, change the product to meet anticipated market needs. And then the last is company culture. Uh, a lot of really, really strong and high-performing teams uh, actually kind of, not, not all of them end up creating a high-performing company. And there's something that shifts between 5 and 15 people uh, where the existing high-performing team needs to actually externalize the way they do things and um, their, their philosophy and their energy and create a high-performing company culture. And so as a company scales, we look for attributes. Uh, the team is really the most important thing to evaluate. And so we look for what we call whole teams. And so these are teams that, uh, with the number of people they have in their founding team that are incentivized primarily by equity, uh, they have all the skill sets necessary to, uh, to build the team and to execute against the market opportunity. So in particular, uh, issues around product design, engineering, uh, marketing, and sales, uh, the attributes of the founding team are extremely important. Uh, the reason I have this um, kind of table or matrix here that goes from 10x to missing uh, is that it's important to see at least one or two places where there's uh, 10x performance. And 10x is kind of Silicon Valley code word for great team members that are way more productive than even good team members. Uh, and so there's um, a lot of evidence that shows that um, the most high-performing team members often outperform even good team members, not by a little, but by a lot. And so we look for um, a whole team where all skill sets are present, and then we also look for uh, 10x performers amongst the team. There are really four early stage milestones uh, investors are hoping that you have achieved before they invest in you. And they, they look for evidence that these uh, various areas of um, what you might call fit have, have, have occurred already. Uh, so the first is that there's a very strong founder market fit. So there's a, a story, a biography, uh, an experience set that demonstrates that uh, this team is in the right market and that this market's going to receive this, this team or this founder uh, very, very well. Um, so we, we look for entrepreneurs that are building kind of their life's great work. And if we told them that they shouldn't do this, they'd probably do it anyway. Um, uh, or if they weren't going to get paid for it, they would do it anyway. The second is a market vision fit. Uh, so there's been a, a process of market development and customer validation and customer development, all of that, um, where uh, they can verify that this vision is very attractive to the market. The third is a product vision fit process where 
Uh, they've iterated and prototyped and simplified their product or services offering uh, to the point where they know that their product actually matches their vision and it's not over scoped, it's not under scoped, it's not adjacent, it's actually the exact right product to achieve the overall vision. And then the last is product market fit, uh, which is a widely discussed term, which means that the, the market demand is really unlocked and is starting to come to the company rather than the company having to go out uh, to the market. So the best evidence of product market fit is uh, a high net promoter score, lots of word of mouth uh, marketing, uh, and in general, anytime Earn Media discusses it, um, you know, you get an influx of customers. So th these early stage milestones, generally investors are wanting you to have accomplished before uh, you receive investment, not before you necessarily meet with an investor, but before you receive an investment. Uh, and most investors these days are trying to invest after product market fit. So the next uh, kind of segment of advice related to product market fit is that um, you really want to create a vision and define a product that finds what um, strategists call a blue ocean. There's actually a book, it's called a Blue Ocean Strategy. It was written by Boston Consulting Group or um, some of the partners and founders of Boston Consulting Group. And uh, one of the activities that we're going to do today is actually to do a strategy campus, which is the um, kind of tangible activity that they teach you how to do in this book, Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, what they mean by blue ocean it, versus red ocean is an analogy to kind of sharks. Um, basically, in a crowded market or in a crowded section of the ocean, you have um, a lot of predator-prey relationships already, and it, if there's blood in the water, aka um, money being made, <laughs> uh, is the analogy, uh, then sharks immediately come and, and swarm the area, and it's not a it's not a good place, safe place to be. It's a dangerous place to be, and so if you're um, you know trying to fish or f identify market opportunities, you don't necessarily want to play in a red ocean, you want to define your market opportunity so that there are no other competitors. You want to set a direction for your team and your strategy uh, where fighting with existing competition isn't your challenge, it's really how quickly can you sail uh, in your own direction. So that's the find a blue ocean. Um, and the art of that is really to position away from your competitors and to create a category in which you are the natural leader. It's worth taking a deeper dive on uh, the word positioning. Um, positioning is extremely important, especially as you're talking to investors, because investors or grant makers, their job is to look at everything. Um, and so often, whereas you know, potentially you've only talked to one or two organizations or can only identify two or three organizations that might be competitors or might be similar. Um, often investors have seen three or four times the number of, of companies that um, claim to do what you are trying to do. Um, often the best ideas are, are not original. They're actually just kind of in the air and many, many types of people are trying to do it uh, do execute against that idea at the same time. So the, the key here in positioning is to uh, differentiate and differentiate several times over. So you need to be able to differentiate uh, your value proposition in the mind of the customer, your target and beachhead markets. And what I mean by that is uh, be a beachhead market is the place where you start. It's the most approachable uh, market that you can grab first. So of different customer segments, uh, which are your target and which are your beachhead markets. And then there's your path to market, uh, which is uh, the way you believe you'll be getting uh, distribution and sales. And uh, you often want to differentiate that as well um, because sales channels or distribution channels get crowded quickly. After you've been able to effectively position yourself and differentiate uh, go back and look at the definition of who you are, where you stand in the market, and, and uh, your overall product offering. Um, being very narrow and focused and, and simplifying uh, your value propositions should also 
have an effect on your overall product definition. Uh, it should have an effect on the ability to define your, your beachhead. And again, your beachhead is your target market that you're starting with as you grow. Uh, it should also help you define your key, key performance indicators uh, and your growth assumptions. Uh, we, at Learn Capital, we hear a lot of strategies in the education space that use the word and, uh, meaning that the way that they, they differentiate is they're, they're going to do two uh, separate things at the same time, or they're going to add to value propositions or functionality uh, of kind of existing solutions. And that rarely pans out for startups. Um, it can pan out for incumbent companies, but it, it rarely pans out for startups because um, there's something called complexity cost. And so everything that you attempt to do uh, becomes uh, more difficult and more challenging and more uh, effortful to maintain the more complex it is. And this is exponential rather than linear. So if it's twice as complex, it's not twice uh, as costly, it's actually four times as costly. So there's a there's an exponential relationship with the complexity. And very small teams of people just have a significant challenge in upkeeping uh, a complex product, a complex code base, a complex customer set. And so um, staying simple and refusing to use the word and as you define your product and def in focus who you are is extremely important. So the tool that the Boston Consulting Group recommends to help find a blue ocean is called the strategy canvas. And a strategy canvas uses the, um, the x-axis um, to list value propositions or attributes or what you might call vectors of competition. And the y-axis is strong at the top and weak at the bottom. And you go through those, uh, those value propositions in a way where uh, you're showing where you're strong and purposefully not competing. And you're showing where your competitors are weak and uh, where they are strong. And if you do it correctly, uh, you should dominate one side of the strategy canvas and your competitors should dominate another side of the, cat the strategy canvas. And what this forces you to do is to decide um, who you are and how you want to compete. And you can't compete on everything, so you have to purposefully choose things you want to be weak on. Uh, this is the role of the strategy canvas. Um, in order to make this session interactive, um, I think you're going to either iterate on a strategy canvas you've already done, or you're going to do a, a strategy canvas kind of right now while we're together. Um, there's an example strategy canvas here on this slide with General Assembly. It shows General Assembly competing with uh, MBA programs. That's their primarily that's their primary competition that they're differentiating against. It also shows um, online courses provided by Udemy, which is another one of our portfolio companies. Um, but as you can see, MBA programs dominate one side, uh, and General Assembly dominates another side. So I'd like you to do that in your own market. Another exercise that's important to do early in the company life cycle or the project life cycle is a persona map. And what you need to do here is to be able to list all of the uh, types of people, either their titles or their character attributes. It often helps if you name them like a fake name, like Susan, um, and uh, list them all, list out their attributes, and um, then prioritize them by your target market or your, your, the target persona uh, for your marketing messages or for your product usage. Um, and then in concentric circles on the way out, um, prioritize kind of who, who it's not for or who it's much less for. Uh, and if you do this correctly, you should have a full understanding of each uh, constituent or stakeholder in the decision making around adopting your, your technology product or service. Um, and you should also be able to kind of force rank them or force prioritize them on the way out from that target concentric circle. Having that present, having that on the wall uh, for your team so that they can make sure that they're uh, weighing trade-offs effectively, that they're prioritizing decisions effectively, um, it can be very important and very unifying for early stage teams. 
So I'd like it if you'd actually um, take this exercise seriously and fill out this persona map. If I had to define what Learn Capital looks for in one statement, it would be the statement, indisputable traction towards a compelling vision in pursuit of a large market opportunity. I've chosen those words very carefully. Um, indisputable traction means that you have um, quantitative proof beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that you are getting traction and growing rapidly into this, this market opportunity. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about moving from anecdotal to quanti quantified validation and traction. Um, compelling vision is also uh, a carefully chosen word. Um, visions are pretty easy to come by. Even compelling visions are easy, <laughs> relatively easy to come by. Um, but the, the vision needs to have a certain amount of uh, magnetism and a certain amount of uh, inevitability around it. Um, and then a large market opportunity is extremely important when dealing with venture investors. Uh, the economics and incentives around venture capital dictate that uh, any one investment needs to potentially return the fund. So if we have a $100 million fund, you would need to be able to exit the uh, company for $100 million dollars uh, or above. And so what that means is that we can't be investing in large markets. So you need to map what you're doing now to uh, a credibly large market opportunity and actually have a compelling vision that that is credible, that gets you from uh, the place you are now to executing into that large market opportunity. It's also worth discussing uh, the kind of two things that every venture investor looks for. Uh, which is um, either or uh, or both of finding uh, either a money printer or a situation where you can't keep up with demand. Um, often these are not found in the same company. Sometimes they are, though. Um, so in education in particular, easy revenue models, easy ways to monetize your product are, are somewhat scarce. Uh, so in terms of finding a money printer, what I mean is that there's a straightforward revenue model that uh, is what we call unit economic positive, meaning you make more money on it than you spend. Uh, and uh, you can just kind of keep on investing in that and it'll keep on returning capital. So the easy ones in education have been textbook rentals and um, student financial instruments, uh, but there are some others as well. Anyway, it's, it's important to try to go after either one of those two situations if not both. Something that we look for in startups uh, we call scaling discipline. And this is essentially the ability to manage uh, runway. What I mean by runway is uh, the amount of time you have left before you die because you run out of cash, uh, which is a scary but straightforward way to put it. Uh, if you're spending $30,000 a month but you're making $20,000 a month, uh, your burn is $10,000 a month. If you have $100,000 in the bank, you have 10 months of runway. It generally takes about six months to raise money, if it's even possible. And so uh, we recommend that startups start raising money at least nine months ahead of when they plan to run out of cash. That being said, the fundraising environment has changed dramatically in the past uh, four to five years because more companies are being seed funded while the same amount of companies are being funded at the Series A and Series B level. So um, what that means is that there's more early stage companies that are getting started that don't find subsequent funding. And that means that you should probably plan for a reality where you can never raise money at all. Um, anyway, what you need to do with your runway is make sure that you're going to achieve financeable milestones. So if you have 10 months left, you need to understand what are the, the kind of business metrics or what are the kind of fundamental uh, changes and dynamics that you need to unlock uh, in order to get investors interested in your project. So uh, what you should probably do is actually just listen to investors talk or listen to donors talk 
and they'll lay out the couple things they would need to see in order to be interested. If you pattern match that across a couple of donors, funders, or investors, you should be able to distill it down to two or three milestones that you need to hit before you come close to running out of cash. So one of the best things you could do as a early stage team is to move from anecdotal validation to quantified validation. And what I mean by that is that uh, every team comes to us and says, oh, I've talked to customers and they love it. Uh, or we have users and they love it. Uh, and that just doesn't really clarify anything because everyone says that. Um, so what you need to do is move uh, from hearing great feedback and getting kind of anecdotal love to quantifying that feedback and making like numerical love or quantified love uh, to uh, talking about demand uh, anecdotally and talking about numbers in the market um, kind of from, from top down and really looking at your revenue potential by having funnel metrics and pipeline value and doing a, a bottom-up kind of a revenue analysis uh, based on market capture. Another thing you can do is, um, uh, is take product success uh, and take basically like anecdotal engagement or vanity metrics around engagement and actually have very defined and measured key performance indicators of how your product is being used and whether or not uh, loyalty and engagement and retention is increasing rather than decreasing. But the exercise here is simply to move um, from uh, hearing that you're doing a good job to really fully understanding what that means and setting about to define how you can do a better job. Another random piece of advice we have to tell people a lot is to just simply stop and reflect on what you've been learning, uh, slow down, uh, be more thoughtful and analytical on your approach. So many entrepreneurs are in such a hurry to try to win customers or raise funding uh, that they don't realize um, they don't realize how much of the reality they're missing and how much wisdom they have yet to ingest. And probably the most productive thing they could do is to slow down and not try to execute so fast and just simply uh, learn as much as possible, beef up their skills. Um, you know, listen more, read some of the, the major works around innovation and startups uh, and things like that. So uh, if I have any random advice, it's, it's you know, slow down uh, and, and learn and reflect and, uh, and analyze and um, actually get better and more wise at what you're doing. Uh, this concludes my remarks uh, for the EdTech Startup Handbook. Um, I am. I should be available for questions right now over over Skype, and hopefully we can engage as a class. Uh, if not, please write down your questions and send them to me uh, either through Twitter or over email, uh, Michael at LearnCapital.com, and uh, hopefully we can schedule a time where I can uh, have a one-on-one -on -one with you uh, this week. All right. Thanks so much, and have a great conference. Enjoy all of the, uh, the opportunities and relationships that you're able to create in that unique environment of WISE.